For most people in the public, their impression of what happened in hospitals during COVID comes from what they saw on TV. But did TV get COVID right? Let's get into it. Let's start with a classic, Grey's Anatomy. The entire East Wing is now a COVID ward. Yes, so this happened. We did this. First, we had a ton of COVID patients and we needed a place to put them. And second, we didn't want to mix COVID and non-COVID patients on the same ward because we didn't want the COVID patients to spread it to the non-COVID patients. So we separated those wards. At the same time, we also divided the staff. So nurses, doctors, even the cleaners were divided into COVID and non-COVID teams. So if someone did contract it, on the COVID team, they were not likely to give it to a patient who didn't have COVID. Also, this way, if there was an outbreak, we wouldn't lose the whole staff at the same time. We've converted whole floors into negative pressure rooms. So those are rooms that have a pressure that's negative relative to the hallway, which means that when you open the door, air gets sucked into the room rather than coming out of the room. So that air that's full of COVID, where the patient was, doesn't actually come out into the hallway. Severe patients go to this special COVID ICU. So far, we have enough ventilators. Well, what about PPE for the staff? We are reusing what we have. Yeah, so totally. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were reusing our face shields, our N95 masks. We even had these face shield cleaning stations where you would go throughout your day just to keep your face shield sterile. And we would write our names on our N95 masks and then send them down for sterilization, pick them up at the end of the shift. Um, and to be honest, there's, there's actually a lot of waste in medicine. So a lot of that, a lot of those habits have kept up even now, and there's just less waste as a result of it. But we need more. A lot. No, 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 no. Well, well, someone's cold in here. And, and we have staff inside to deal with it. Look. Yeah, that's exactly right. So when someone's coding, there's, they're basically dying. And so our natural instinct as doctors is when you hear those code bells, you run to the bedside to help. But in COVID, we couldn't do that because everyone would just get contaminated. So we had these COVID code teams and they ran what are called protected code blues, which means that you had to get fully dressed in PPE before entering that room, which was terrible because every second is so precious, but you're kind of fiddling with your mask and your gown and your gloves. And while you're doing that, your patient's dying. Hospitals are losing too many of their own. So no one goes through these doors without full PPE, which is in short supply. Yes, it goes against everything we teach, but there are no emergencies in a pandemic. Marvin Lindstrom, 83. He was fine yesterday. Became hypoxic an hour ago. It's the fourth patient I've lost today. And they're all dying alone. And that's the saddest part people dying without their loved ones by their side. And it went against everything we've ever been taught or just even basic human decency. But we had no choice. If people came in, they would catch the virus. And it was that human aspect of medicine that the pandemic kind of took from us. Check this out from The Good Doctor. That is what we looked like. So you've got a gown, gloves, you got a surgical cap, you got a mask, which actually should be an N95 mask. And in this case, he's wearing glasses, which ideally should be a face shield. But the point is that you can barely see the person under there. And that's why he's wearing this. Um, so instead of our usual tiny ID badges with those washed out pictures, in COVID, someone had the brilliant idea of creating these giant pictures of your face that you hang around your neck. So now patients could put a face to a name and basically connect with the person who's taking care of them. This is the other thing. People couldn't physically be there with their loved ones when they were sick. And because having your family there is such an important part of the healing and recovery process, we relied really heavily on technology during the pandemic. And this was a game changer. I can't even imagine how things went down 100 years ago when we had the last major global pandemic. There were times in COVID when children were actually saying their last goodbyes to their parents by FaceTime. And it sounds horrible, it is horrible, but it's better than just getting that phone call from the doctor. Yes. Why are you here? It helps Martin relax, knowing that I'm around. You think it helps Martin miss you less? Thank you. 
Martin has a heart murmur. What? Martin, Martin. Hello, I'm glad you're awake. You may have a bacterial abscess on your heart valve. Nah, I know he's a genius, but you, you know, a lot of people have murmurs. You can't tell that it's a bacterial infection of the heart valve just by listening to it with a stethoscope. More importantly, you never panic like that in front of a family member. The reaction he just had will make that man's wife so anxious. And what's worse is that she's not even there. So she's gonna be sitting around at home for the next several hours waiting for that phone call. Not good form. But speaking of form, let's see this clip from the resident. So there's a very specific way that you're supposed to put your PPE on to avoid contaminating yourself. Just got her gloves. No, 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 stop right there. So you always start by washing your hands. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they've done that. Then you put on your gown, then your mask, then your face shield, and then lastly, your gloves. So the gloves are always last so you don't contaminate them. Okay. So wrong order for the gloves, but this is actually really accurate. And you may be wondering why she's putting a surgical mask on top of an N95 mask when an N95 mask is basically the best protection you can get. Well, the reason is what I was saying earlier, which is that we were really short of N95 masks. We were reusing them across multiple patients. So what we were doing was we were trying to keep that precious N95 on all day, and we were using those cheaper and more available surgical masks to cover the N95 mask to possibly keep that surface from getting contaminated. And then we would just replace our surgical masks between patients. And this is something that I've never seen done before COVID, but it's totally accurate. You never look better. You too. <laughs> ready for the next shift? Yeah, I'm ready. And we are not leaving, Huntley. No! So first of all, this never happens. Second of all, they've just contaminated their gloves and their face shields. Okay, so there were some cheers, some pop banging happened, at least for the first few months of this pandemic, but this slow motion main character vibe thing, that never happened. And there were no crowds with signs outside of hospitals because that would be exactly how the virus spread, so it wasn't allowed. But it did feel really nice to be appreciated, at least at the beginning of the pandemic, and at least until this started happening. As crowds protested outside two Vancouver hospitals, a paramedic says she feared for the bleeding patient in the back of her ambulance. So these protests did affect patient care in some cases, and they got so bad at some point that my hospital actually recommended that we wear plain clothes to work so people wouldn't recognize that we're healthcare workers. So far cry from... Okay, one last one. It's not TV, but I have to give a shout out to this movie because the movie Contagion came out in 2011, like eight years before the pandemic. But it's scary how spot on so many aspects of this movie are. You've got the scientists, the government reaction, the way society started fraying at the edges. You've got conspiracy theories. You even have people who tried to make a profit by lying about the pandemic. That was Jude Law's character. In fact, it's so spot on that it's almost like someone planned the pandemic. Just kidding. But this scene deserves an award. We have 47 cases and eight deaths as of five this afternoon. It's a weekend. These numbers might be low. People are staying home for a couple of days, see if they get any better. So at this point, I think we have to believe this is respiratory. Yes. When you have a fast spreading virus, the most likely route of transmission is the air. So the most likely source of entry into the body is the lungs or the respiratory system. Maybe fomites too. What's that, fomites? Uh, it refers to transmission from surfaces. So a fomite is basically any inanimate object that can carry the virus. So things like clothes, utensils, furniture, groceries. Remember Sanjay Gupta showing us how to wipe down our groceries early in the pandemic? It turns out that for the virus that causes COVID, the vast majority of transmission is through droplets and aerosols or direct transmission. 
There's very little transmission through fomites. But when a virus first appears, you just don't know that. The average person touches their face two or three thousand times a day. Two or three thousand times a day? Three to five times every waking minute. Okay, so it sounds crazy, but there have actually been studies on this. There's a so-called T-zone on the face, so the highest risk locations for giving yourself the virus. The eyes, nose, mouth, and chin. T. And this review found that people touch their T-zone on average 69 times an hour. That's actually more than once every single minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, elevator buttons, and each other. Those things become fomites. Is this something we want to release to the press, respiratory and fomites? And how's the public going to react to that? Hard to say. A plastic shark in a movie will keep people from getting in the ocean, but a warning on the side of a pack of cigarettes from We're going to need to walk the government through this before we start to freak everybody more. out. Okay, I can't tell you how often scientists and doctors have felt like this during the pandemic. We still feel like this. You're basically telling someone in government how to prevent people from dying, and they're more concerned about how people are going to react. I mean, we can't even tell people right now what they should be afraid of. We tried that with swine flu and all we did was get healthy people scared. It's the biggest shopping weekend of the year. I think we need to consider closing the schools down. And who stays home with the kids? People that work at stores, government workers, people that work at hospitals. When will we know what this is? What causes it? What cures it? Things that keep people calm. It takes time. What we need to determine is this. For every person who gets sick. How many other people are they likely to infect? So, for seasonal flu, that's usually about one. Smallpox, on the other hand, it's over three. Now, before we had a vaccine, polio spread at a rate between four and six. Now, we call that number the r naught. R stands for the reproductive rate of the virus. Any ideas what that might be for this? How fast it multiplies depends on a variety of factors. The incubation period, how long a person is contagious. Sometimes people can be contagious without even having symptoms. We need to know that too. And we need to know how big the population of people susceptible to the virus might be. So far that appears to be everyone with hands, a mouth, and a nose. Once we know the r naught, we'll be able to get a handle on the scale of the epidemic. So this is pretty technical for a movie, but again, it's spot on. In fact, you might have heard some of us talking about this r naught figure for the virus that causes COVID. And for that virus, the r naught is estimated to be between 5 and 6, which is actually very high, and which is why we're in this mess. That r naught is the virus's intrinsic ability to spread. But there are a whole bunch of things that, as you know, we can do to reduce what's called the effective reproductive number of the virus, or what's called RT. When that RT is less than 1, the average person will infect less than one other person and the pandemic will eventually peter out. If it's one, the pandemic will kind of stay where it is, and if it's more than one, the pandemic will grow. So we've been obsessed with trying to get that RT down below one, and we have effectively done that at various points in this pandemic with things like vaccination, masks, ventilation, and social distancing. So thank you, Kate Winslet. So overall, I'd say that medical shows did pretty well with the pandemic. They probably consulted with doctors who are taking care of actual COVID patients. But are there other shows and movies that we should be talking about? If so, hit us up in the comments, check out our other science content, and subscribe for more.